Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and in this video we're going to look at the Federal Railroad Administration Pacific Northwest High Speed Rail Corridor. The FRA has defined this corridor as linking Eugene, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, and Vancouver, British Columbia. Generally, the FRA defines high-speed rail as 110 mile per hour diesel electric, but will investigate this corridor in terms of true high-speed rail at speeds of 150 miles per hour or more. We're not alone in this endeavor. A consortium of governments has studied this concept many times over the past decade. Private groups have also sprung up to advocate for the idea. All of these entities have their ideas of what such a system should look like, but I'm going to take a crack at figuring it out myself. I'll show you the route I've come up with to link these four metropolitan areas, how fast I think it can reasonably run, and how much that might cost. First, let's take a look at our four metro areas. Eugene, Oregon has a metro population of about 400,000 and sits on the southern end of the Willamette Valley. This valley is about 120 miles long, 20 miles wide, and will be our conduit through Oregon. Eugene is the smallest of our metros in question, but better connections to Portland could spur growth throughout the Willamette Valley southward. It is also home to the University of Oregon Ducks. Eugene's public transportation consists of bus service via the Lane Transit District. Intercity rail is provided by the Amtrak Cascades route, which is in the same corridor we're using for high-speed rail, but on freight rights-of-way. Portland, Oregon is a metro of 2.5 million. It is the home of the Trailblazers. Transit is through TriMet, which provides bus service, the MAX light rail service, and a slightly dopey commuter rail service called WES. All that's missing is Stu! Portland also has the Portland Streetcar, which is owned by the city. Amtrak Cascades has three stops within the Portland metro area. Eugene, Portland, and Seattle are also served by Amtrak's long-distance daily Coast Starlight, which connects to Los Angeles. The Seattle-Washington metro has a population of 4.1 million people. It is the largest metro in our quartet and home to a gaggle of top-tier sports teams. Seattle has a complex web of local transit provided by various agencies. This includes bus service, express bus, streetcar, light rail, commuter rail, monorail, water taxi, and ferry services. Amtrak Cascades has six stops within the metro. Metro Vancouver, British Columbia has a population of 2.6 million and of course it's across the border in Canada. Home of the Canucks. Transit governance is a little complicated but all falls under the Transit Link umbrella. Services include bus, light metro, commuter rail, and a ferry service cutely named Seabus. Now that we've laid out the mission and described the metros, let's go over the guiding principles for our route selection. These fit into three categories, urbanism, cost, and safety and speed. For safety and speed, we'll want to design sealed corridors that are grade separated, separated from freight rail, and with a minimal amount of tight curves. We would also like our main line to bypass dense cities going either under or around. On cost, we'd like to avoid viaducts, trenches, and tunnels, keeping things at ground level when possible. For urbanism, we would like stations to be located in denser metro cores near existing transit systems. With all that said, let's start at the southern end of our proposed system in Eugene, Oregon. Because passenger rail access to the city core is hemmed in by development, a new dedicated high-speed right-of-way would likely need to enter the city underground. This frees up location choice and I am putting the station at the downtown bus depot for convenient transit access. Here's a look at local access to the site within 15 minutes via different modes of travel. 
The best and fastest way toward Portland to the north is Interstate 5, which can be accessed via a two mile long tunnel under the Willamette River and through the Interstate 105 corridor. Interstate 5 possesses a median of adequate width to support double tracking at ground level for about 80% of the distance between Eugene and Portland. Speed out of Eugene is capped slightly by a couple of freeway curves before Interstate 5 heads due north for 33 miles at 200 miles per hour where it reaches Albany. From there, the train would start to slow coming into Salem, Oregon, which is the state capital. The geometry of the freeway constrains speed here to 90 miles per hour with adjacent freight rights of way unable to provide a better alternative. Due to local topography, the presence of a couple of wildlife refuges, suburban sprawl, and the orientation of Interstate 5, a good route to bypass Salem does not exist, so we go through at 90 miles per hour. North of Salem, the freeway is once again quite straight, allowing 200 mile per hour travel in the median for about another 15 miles before needing to slow slightly for a curve and a second crossing of the Willamette River while entering the southern suburbs of Portland, Oregon. We'll go over the river at 150 miles per hour and proceed about 10 miles north into the suburbs before needing to go underground. There is no good way to get through or around the Portland metro area on the surface at speed, so I opted for a tunnel, a 19 mile tunnel. Once underground, you can go pretty much wherever, so I picked this area next to Portland Union Station that is about to be redeveloped into high-density mixed use. This site is situated between Portland Streetcar and Max Light Rail stations. Here is what local 15-minute travel times look like. Coverage for the city core is pretty good. This would be a deep bore tunnel because it needs to get under both the Willamette and Columbia River navigational channels. I did not see a viable connection across the Columbia River to existing freight or Interstate 5, so I went with Interstate 205, which has an available median 10 miles from my chosen downtown Portland station site. This path also coincidentally goes under Portland International Airport for a convenient connection there if desired. Once in Washington State and the Interstate 205 median, things are fairly slow. I have speed around 110 miles per hour here, and that will continue after merging with Interstate 5, 7 miles to the north. Southern Washington is generally slow around both the interstate and BNSF's nearby Seattle subdivision. Geometry is inconsistent enough to keep speed at or below 125 miles per hour for about 70 miles north of downtown Portland. That trend is broken as the route crosses the Cowlitz River near Vader, Washington. From there, things can be massaged to allow 175 mile per hour travel for about 10 miles. That changes again near Centralia where the BNSF tracks and Interstate 5 cross. North of there for about 33 miles, the BNSF right of way is more direct and has a better geometry, so I'm going with it. This decision is not without drawbacks, is Chehalis and Centralia would suffer some of the more severe demolition impacts on the route. The transition and the next 14 miles would be 110 miles per hour, then 150 miles per hour for 21 miles after that until reaching Interstate 5 again. Continuing straight would be quicker, but would require cutting a new path through Fort Lewis, which I'm not willing to rely on. Things slow to 90 miles per hour alongside the interstate due to geometry that cannot be improved because of recent freeway widening efforts there. That continues for 12 miles before going back underground near the intersection of Interstate 5 and State Route 512. This tunnel would be about 13 miles long and emerge in the State Route 167 median in the Duwamish Valley. Speed through the tunnel would be 150 miles per hour. 
I'm sticking with State Route 167 because its right-of-way offers a little more engineering freedom and that results in 150 mile per hour travel through the area. On the north end of the valley, we'll transition out of that and next to BNSF right-of-way. This is currently used for elevated utility transmission, but those lines can be buried. Due to numerous road crossings in the area, this portion of the tracks would need to be elevated. Then back underground in a three mile tunnel before emerging next to a BNSF intermodal yard. Some expensive work here to squeeze between BNSF operations and Interstate 5, but it's possible and still at 150 miles per hour. This would continue for four miles before once again needing to enter a tunnel. This would lead to our Seattle stop four miles distant after 45 miles of 150 mile per hour travel in the Seattle area. I have the station under the current King Street station. This isn't the most dense part of the city, but transit access here is excellent as evidenced by this 15 minute local travel map. North out of the King Street area, there is no good existing high speed route in any direction. This will lead to another 15 miles of tunnel to reach a portion of Interstate 5, five miles north of Seattle at the border of Mount Lake Terrace and Linwood. Despite being in the freeway median, we'd need to mostly trench through here thanks to a couple of weirdo intersections consuming the median. Freeway running would continue for eight miles before entering yet another tunnel in Everett, Washington. This would emerge in the Snohomish River Valley. The goal here is to bypass the core of Everett, which would be a major pain via existing rights of way. After five miles of greenfield routing, mostly elevated, the route would rejoin Interstate 5. Geometry is favorable here and our hypothetical train would reach 200 miles per hour at this point from the south. 200 mile per hour travel would continue for another 25 miles until reaching Mount Vernon in northern Washington. I have this as the third and last full speed section of the route. From here things get pretty slow for a while. Let's talk about alternatives and why I picked the slow one along Interstate 5. A faster overall option is to bypass Mount Vernon and Burlington, Washington, and then follow BNSF's Sumas Division through a narrow river valley to the Canadian border at Sumas, then across to Vancouver, mostly in the Canada One Freeway right of way. This is a much quicker route, but because it's 25 miles longer, it would take the same amount of time. It would also require a similar amount of tunneling. Another option would be about 20 miles of greenfield route through mostly farms to the west of Burlington, then a 15 mile tunnel under the mountains and Bellingham, Washington. I rejected this because we're already dealing with a lot of tunneling expense. I have that option as 20 minutes faster, but six and a half billion dollars more expensive. You can decide if that's a tenable option after hearing the overall Eugene to Vancouver time and cost estimates. Back to the chosen route, this sticks to the Interstate 5 right-of-way through Mount Vernon, Burlington, and Bellingham, Washington, and the mountains between. You're looking at 26 miles of 90 mile per hour travel to the Lake Samish area. From there, down to 60 miles per hour through the mountains and Bellingham for 15 miles. From there, things are pretty straight through farmland at 150 miles per hour for 15 miles until reaching the complication of the border, which would slow the route to 110. Once in Canada, Interstate 5 turns into BC 99, and that is fine for 150 mile per hour travel again just north of the border. I have the route following BC 99 under the Fraser River in a half mile long tunnel then just barely squeezing through the preceding curve at 150 miles per hour with a small amount of land acquisition. This will continue until reaching BC 91. From there, it is eight miles of tunnel to reach Vancouver's waterfront station. Pacific Central Station is a slightly cheaper option needing one less mile of tunnel, but it's not as well integrated with the city's core. With that, we'll make it from Eugene, Oregon to Vancouver, British Columbia.
Let's check travel times. From Eugene to Portland, it is 107 miles. I have that taking 41 minutes for an average of 157 miles per hour. Portland to Seattle, this route is 176 miles. I have that at one hour and 28 minutes for an average of 120 miles per hour. Seattle to Vancouver, this conservative option would be 143 miles. I estimate travel time at one hour, 11 minutes for an average of 121 miles per hour. For the full route, Eugene to Vancouver, this corridor in this form is 426 miles long. With a conventional high-speed rail train, this would take 3 hours, 20 minutes with stops for an overall average of 128 miles per hour. For comparison, the use of a tilting train like an Alstom Avelia with a top speed of 186 miles per hour would cut 10 minutes off Portland to Seattle, 6 minutes from Seattle to Vancouver, and would be a minute slower from Eugene to Portland for a Eugene to Vancouver total of three hours, five minutes with stops at an average of 138 miles per hour. Since this is a linear regional corridor, let's see how this high-speed rail train would compare to flying. A quick check of flights shows about 98 daily commercial flights between the four large airports in the region. Here is a comparison of travel times. Assuming a one hour airport time penalty, high-speed rail compares favorably. It appears that about 80% of intra-regional commercial air travel could be eliminated through construction of a competent high-speed rail system here. But what would that cost? Let's review my cost estimating algorithm and some sample results to show that it produces reasonable ballpark figures. And now for this system of 426 miles, Connecting the four major metropolitan areas of the Pacific Northwest, I have an estimated cost of $79 billion. Destruction is moderate with 66 structures demolished and probably three times that many properties acquired. If it's going to cost that much, maybe you spring for that extra tunnel and save 20 minutes between Vancouver and Seattle for an extra six and a half billion. Recent official estimates for such a system have fallen into the $36 to $63 billion range in 2023 dollars. Converting into the $2028 dollars that I'm using morphs that into $44 to $77 billion, so we're not far off on the high end. But let me know what you think. Is it worth it? What would you do differently? Do you have any creative solutions for Portland or Seattle that don't involve 19 mile long tunnels? Let me know in the comments. Plenty more of your favorite channel series to come, including two more videos left in this Federal Railroad Administration High Speed Rail Corridors series. By the way, there's a new game on the Lucid Group Discord server called Everything But Transit Is Lava where you try to figure out the best route between two points using only transit. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway!